Welcome to the storehouse. We are open for business because we weren't last Sunday. Was anybody, I don't know if any visitors might have showed up last Sunday and got this, saw the sign, we're closed down. Hopefully we got, we, we, I think we contacted most people through Facebook and co phone calls and me and Trace went out and we actually was driving around. So we had a water issue downstairs where we had no water coming upstairs or anywhere in the building and so that's fixed. So if anybody was inconvenienced, we apologize um, for that. Uh, Clark will be back with us uh, this evening. Uh, he took a break last, uh, last weekend, last Sunday evening uh, because of the 4th. So Clark Robinson will be back tonight, 5.30 to 6.30. He's teaching a, a class titled um, Winds of Adversity, just talking about uh, trials and things, that, difficulties we experience as believers in this world, in this life as we're passing through and what we do with those or how we respond to them. Uh, it's been a great class, so I'd encourage you, if you can, come out for that tonight, 5.30 to 6.30. Then we bumped our first Sunday of the month to this Sunday because of the 4th. Uh, so the ladies, the lace will be meeting tonight, 6.30ish uh, to about 8. And then the men, we will be looking at um, a teaching uh, titled Holiness Above Comfort. Holiness Above Comfort. So if you can come out tonight for that at 6.30 uh, after Clark's class, uh, do that. Uh, food pantry uh, has been, uh, well, the delivery anyways has been changed a little bit this week. Because of the 4th, uh, the deliveries got all bumped back a week. So we, we couldn't get the delivery to come to the church, or at least for the uh, Pennsylvania Food Pantry, the warehouse to bring it. So Connie and Pete, and I think some other folks are going up to get the food, but they can't get it till later on in the afternoon. And we don't really know when it's gonna get here. Um, we're thinking around 5.30ish, kind of, on Tuesday. Um, they're gonna come in with the trailer with the same probably four or five pallets of food that we get. So we're gonna need some, ha uh, some hands to help get that off the trailer and get a put foot in the food pantry this Tuesday at around 5.30 or so. Um, I'm going to get in contact with Connie and see if maybe she can give me a call or so when they're leaving Harrisburg, and I could put something out about that. And then obviously the food pantries this Wednesday from 12 to 4, if you can come out and help uh, with that. And then <clears throat> good news, Lee and Tina Nunemaker will be with us July 23rd, two weeks from now. If you guys don't know uh, Lee, he was the pastor before me. Uh, him and his family, Tina and the boys, got called. They're, they went to long-term missions, so to speak, for I think a four-year um, mission uh, down into Haiti. And so they're, they're back from Haiti right now, and so they're going to be with us on the 23rd. He's going to be speaking at the service, and then he's going to be uh, at the learning group after service with a PowerPoint and just talking about what God's doing in Haiti and the things there. And so we're going to have time with just questions and just listening to what Lee and Tina are doing in Haiti. So Ju July 23rd, uh, the Nuna Makers um, will be back with us. Open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. When you, get to, when you get to Ephesians 4, we're going to be in there a little bit, and, we're not going to, and we've already kind of looked at this section a couple of weeks ago, or actually maybe a month or so back. Um, Ephesians 4, and then throw a finger in 1 Thessalonians 5. Ephesians 4, and then 1 Thessalonians 5. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord, and we thank you for Christ. and. Lord, he's the reason why we gather this morning. He's the reason why we come together as a people, Lord, to celebrate him, to worship him, Lord, to lift him up. That, Lord, this morning's not about us, Lord, but it's about you and, and the good things you have done in our lives, Lord, saving us, setting us free, placing us, Lord, in right position with you because of Christ. And, and so, Lord, this morning as we dive into your word, I pray that your word would speak to our hearts, it would challenge us this morning, Lord, it would encourage us. Father, it would draw, draw us into just a deeper relationship with Jesus, that, Lord, we might look like him in a greater way, leaving out of here this morning. Lord, help us to look for opportunities to share that love with people, Lord, through the grace that you've given us in Jesus' name. Amen. If you guys are visiting with us this morning, we're back to this, uh, our series here. We're probably only going to be in it for a couple more, week, or a couple more weeks, probably next week, and then Lee and Tina will be here on the 23rd, and might end it the last Sunday, maybe the first Sunday of August. Uh, so we're, at the, we're spending our third time now in this idea of people of power, our identity in Christ out of 1 Peter 2, uh, that we have this new identity. So we've been looking at some identifying marks uh, that will be on your life if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. If, if you've had that born-again experience, you've been brought into the body of Christ, there's going to be some identifiers that will definitely be on your life. So we've been talking about that. And like I said, this is the third week that we're going to talk about, and really that's going to be the last week that we're going to talk about this idea uh, of being people of power. And so we talked about Acts chapter 1 um, and verse 8, 
uh, where Jesus said this about this power. He says, you will receive power uh, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, uh, and you will be witness, my witnesses uh, telling uh, people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, uh, throughout Judea, in Samaria, um, and into the ends of the earth. And a couple weeks ago, we talked about this idea of, of people of power, that we will have this power, and ultimately uh, what it's for is, and he says right here, is to be his witnesses to people, is to live the life uh, that Christ was living then, now he's living through us, to people around us. And, and we spent a little bit of time talking about what, um, and, and you know he's one of my favorite guys, I read him, I you know, I, I do devotions with his devotions, his books, and just some of the things that, you know, he just challenges me for some reason. But A.W. Tozer, uh, when he was talking about this, actually out of Luke 24, when Jesus was given that command to, to go and to wait and that they were going to be endued with power on high, but Tozer, uh, his commentary on that word power, and I really like uh, how he defines it. If you remember, he said the word power behind it actually means able to do, or you're able to do something. And that's what we see here. You will receive power. You're going to have the ability to do something when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And I think, obviously, uh, living a life right before the Lord, we're reconciled with God. But then the ability to do, and we see that in Acts 2, when Peter stands up and it says, being filled with the Holy Spirit, he stands up and he communicates Christ to those people. And then Christ, working through his life, gave Peter really the ability to do that. And then, a then Christ adds uh, to the church then, there in verse 27 of Acts 2, uh, daily those that were being so we're going to talk about this morning uh, power, and we've kind of talked about the necessity of having power in our lives. Uh, number one, to live right before the Lord, but also to be effective ministers, ambassadors for Christ uh, into the world. Like what Tozer is saying, we have that ability to do. And so as I was thinking about uh, this power, you know, it's the same power which is the Holy Spirit coming upon us, living in us. It's the same Holy Spirit that came upon Christ and lived it, you know, in Christ and gave him the ability to do all that we study through the Gospels. You know, you think about Peter, the same thing. Peter had the ability to do because he had the power living in him. You know, people that we read, Oswald Chambers, D.L. Moody, Corey Ten Boom, some of the people of the faith that we kind of hold up and we recognize the power that was in their lives. Um, and so as I think about that, that's the same Holy Spirit that lives in us. That's the, Holy, the same Holy Spirit that's brought us together as a storehouse, as a community of believers that's living in, a, in us individually and is here working in our lives. And so the question that I ask myself is, do I have that power in my life? I think sometimes we've got to be careful, though. I have to be careful because I will try to uh, compare myself to somebody like to Tozer or D.L. Moody or Paul. You know? And as, especially the Apostle Paul, I think about his life um, in the book of Acts, um, Jesus said about Paul, he says, you know, I'm going to show Paul the things that he has to do to suffer for me. And so Paul had a specific ministry that the Lord gave him in that we have specific ministry that the Lord gives us. So we may not be like the Apostle Paul or like Moody or Ten Boom or Elizabeth, Elizabeth Elliot and these people that we think of, uh, but we still have the same spirit living in us to give us the ability to do, you know, in the communities and the influence that we have with the people, in, you know, around us. So as I was thinking about that, uh, a couple verses came to mind. John chapter 16, verse 7, and then a couple verse, chapters back, John 14, 12 through 17. This is what Jesus says about this ability to do or having this power, being people of power, and what it might look like. In John 16, verse 7, this is what he says. He says, I tell you the truth. He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper which is the Holy Spirit, the helper will not come to you, but if I depart, the word if is actually an emphatic, it's, it's when I depart, I'm going to depart. It if I depart, I will send him to you. So it was to their advantage, and in my mind, I kind of go through that as I'm thinking about these uh, apostles listening to what Jesus says there, where he says, it's to your advantage that I go away. You can almost see them like, why? You know, we've been waiting for you for so long. You're the promised Messiah. We're walking with you. I mean, they were right there touching him, with him, seeing him do things. And there was probably this, they were wrestling with this in their minds. But Jesus says it was actually to their advantage that he goes away. They may not have understood that. And sometimes I think in our own lives, there's an advantage of certain things going away in our lives so that this will come true in, a, in I think, a greater sense, in a more powerful sense, giving us a greater ability to do things when Jesus makes that promise and says, then the Holy Spirit's going to operate through you. And they may not have understood that when Jesus spoke at that moment, but then in Acts 2, they saw it come alive. 
the Holy Spirit coming into the life of, of those that were waiting, those 120, and they just went out and radically changed the world by the power of God's Spirit. So why is it to their advantage? Why is it to our advantage that we now operate in the Holy Spirit? Well, John chapter 14, like I said a couple chapters earlier, this is what Jesus says. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he, and he will be he in you. And we see that then in Acts chapter 2, the, the indwelling of God's Spirit. But the first part there in verse 12 this is the why behind us to our advantage. is because of the works that we're going to do. If you think about that, he says, um, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he, uh, he will also do. And then you study the life of Christ in the Gospels, and who's doing those things? Let's just be honest. Who's really doing the things that Jesus did? And then he adds to it and says, but greater things that I even did on this earth, you guys are going to do with the Spirit living through you. You know, as I think about that, I haven't raised nobody from the dead. I haven't healed nobody's eyes. You know, I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't prayed for people and leprosies left them. You know, I didn't stand on a mountain and, and glory came all over me, really from inside me for who he is. But as I was looking at this, this is what I, this is what I think that he's talking about because of that promise in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. When they receive this power, when they're endued with power on high, they're clothed with this power we talked about. Instead of it being in one location in Christ, now it's in multiple locations. It's in multiple locations. If you understand God's glory in the temple, that's where God's glory dwelled in the Old Testament. It was in the temple. That's where when people would come and they would see the majesty of who God is and his glory, it was the temple and it was in the lives of his people. But now, you know, the Bible tells us that we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. And we have the God's Spirit living in us. And we have that ability to do or that power. Number one, it changes our lives radically. And then God works through us by this ability to do or this power by the Holy Spirit. So that's what I believe that he's talking about. And we still have all the access to everything Christ did. Because what happens is when we're operating in Christ and allowing God's Spirit to, to move through us and to work through us and to change our lives with the ultimate goal that the Father may be glorified in the Son, that they, he receives all the glory, then we have freed up the Spirit, so to speak, to do things we have no ability to do. Only he has the ability to do. And so... For me, I've been wrestling now a number, I don't even know, months, maybe even a year or two, with this idea, you know, reading these stories, and I read it several weeks ago about D.L. Moody's experience with God's Spirit. Um, we follow a guy named Carter Conlon up in the Times Square Church, and I'd listen to his testimony about, this, about him just, he was a pastor, but he, he just felt a dryness in his life. He, he, you know, if he was to look at this and says, you know, I just don't have that ability to do, I don't really have the, the power in me to do the things you know, that I want to do or to be well-pleasing to him or to have impact in people's lives. And he began to just spend a season, the same thing with D.L. Moody and many men and women of God that just felt a dryness in their spirit, wanting to know Christ in a deeper way and having that power, that ability to do. They just fall before Christ for a season in their lives and God's spirit comes upon them. And if you listen to Carter Connell, we played it here a couple weeks ago, actually with the guys I think in the back room, but um, he, he talked about this time when the spirit came upon him and he says there, there's, there was no words that could explain, there was no experience on earth that we experienced that could have explained the feeling that he had. It was a feeling of, of just gr uh, grace and love that he's never experienced. But as he said also at the same time, it was like he begged God to take his hand off of him for fear of dying. It was so powerful. And if you watch Carter Collins' ministry now, when he speaks, he speaks the word of the Lord in power affecting your lives. And so for me, as I look at these stories, I'm like, I don't possess any of that. I'm just going to be honest, I don't possess any of that. In my own life, I don't feel that. Uh, there's, there's times I feel dryness, I feel disconnected sometimes. And, and, you know, the Bible says as we draw close to God, he draws close to us, and maybe it's my fault and I'm moving away. But for me, I have this desperation in my own spirit. Is Lord, I don't want to mimic or, or, or be like them, but I still want that ability to do. I want to be, have that ability of you living in me to live right before you and to have an impact to people as I, as I speak to them, as I'm around them. And so as I was thinking about this, this is the question 
that we're going to wrestle with a little bit this morning. So what can hinder the Holy Spirit in our lives? <clears throat> what can hinder that ability to do or that power of the Holy Spirit in our lives? So we're going to look at two pretty, uh, I think they're, they're, they're kind of tough. They're, they challenge me, these sections in Ephesians and 1 Thessalonians. And I think the first thing, and I just want to read this first because it's the last thing that Jesus says to the seven churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 from Ephesus to Laodicea as he speaks to those churches. This is what he says to each one of those churches as he has something to say to them. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And so I think this morning that's what we, we need to have ears to hear. And that word hear actually means hearing to understanding, hearing to almost obedience. You hear, like there's times that my wife talks and I hear, but I don't hear. Or she'll say, did you hear what I said? She's actually smirking back there because this happens probably every day. But that's not what this says. He, he, what Jesus is telling us, have an ear to hear so that you're actually listening and then you're taking what I'm saying and you're putting it into practice in your life. So we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 4, specifically verse 30, and then 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19 there, but we're going to read within context. We're not going to spend a lot of time in Ephesians 4 because we're going to look at a, a large section of verses 11 through 32, and then 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 24. But before we go into Ephesians 4, I want to read this devotion that I ran into, and I think it speaks volumes uh, to, to answer the question, you know, what can hinder the Holy Spirit in our lives? What can hinder that power, you know, operating in our lives and through our lives? Uh, to be people that are sold out for Christ affecting the world. This is what Tozer says in a devotion about Ephesians 4 and verse 30. The title of the Spirit, or, the, or this devotion is called this. It's called the Holy Spirit, and it's not going to be on the screen, so just kind of listen to me. I was just thinking of this this morning, this devotion. It's a, so the title of this devotion is called the Holy Spirit, He Can Be Grieved. So that's what Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God. So Tozer says, the, it's titled, The Holy Spirit, He Can Be Grieved. Now listen to what he says. It's off of Ephesians 4.30. He says this. He says, because He, that's the Holy Spirit, because He is loving and kind and friendly, the Holy Spirit may be grieved. He can be grieved because He is loving. And there must be love present before there can be grief. And, and now he gives kind of just a real, this real quick illustration of the story. He says, suppose you had a 17-year-old son who began to go bad. He rejected your counsel and wanted to take things into his own hands. Suppose that he joined up with a, a, a young stranger from another part of the city and they got into trouble. You were called down to the police station. Your boy and another boy who you had never seen sat there in handcuffs. You know how you would feel about it. You would be sorry for the other boy, but you would but you don't love him because you don't know him. With your own son, your grief would penetrate to your heart like a sword. Only love can grieve. If those two boys were sent off to prison, you might pity the boy who didn't know, you didn't know, but you would grieve over the boy you knew and loved. A mother can grieve because she loves. If you don't love, you can't grieve. And then he kind of ends with the prayers. He does his, these devotions that I read, and he says this. This is kind of just a prayer. He says, Lord, I think I take your love for granted and consequently forget how grieved you are when I sin. Overwhelm me today with your love so that I might be more careful not to grieve you. And then he closes with amen. I mean, think about the truth behind that. Isn't that true? You can't be grieved if you don't love. If I don't care about you and you do something to me, I'm, I might get frustrated or angry, and sometimes we do that as well, but that's all I'm probably going to get. But if I care about you, if I love you, and I'm talking about one of those kind of unconditional love, I, I genuinely love you, I genuinely care about you, I, I want the best interest, the best things in your life, and you do something that maybe against that love, or against, I become greed. Being greed, if anybody here, I mean, if you, there's a difference between feeling bad or just kind of you're going through a bad, but being grieved is completely different. Be grieved, is, it, it, to me, I think of being grieved into the heart. It's, in, it's an inner thing that you can't explain to nobody when you've been hurt in such a way because you have great love for the other person. And so that's what Paul talks about uh, here in Ephesians chapter 4, and I believe what Tozer was talking about. And if I was to say this without having Ephesians 4.30, it almost sounds blasphemous to me that, I, that somehow we have the ability to grieve the heart of God. Because God is sufficient in and of himself. I mean, when you look at Isaiah 6 and Revelation 4 and 5, you see God on his throne. He is complete. 
They, angels worship him. He, let's just be honest, he really doesn't need us. But he loves us, and he desires that we be reconciled to him. That's why Christ came. But like I said, I, I think it would sound horrible if I said that, well, I can grieve God's heart. I can make God grieve. Well, the Bible tells, God's word tells us that we can actually do that. And the reason why I think that we can do that, and I, actually it is the reason why, is because God loves us so much. He, it's an unconditional love that he has for us. It's, you know, he wants us to be who we are as the church, individually before him, but collectively united together. And I think it, as we go down this, through this section, like I said, I'm not going to pick it apart too much. We're going to read Ephesians 4, 11 down through 32. And we're going to, uh, I think, answer that question, you know, how can I hinder the Holy Spirit or how can I grieve him in such a way that ultimately 1 Thessalonians 5 says, do not quench the Spirit, that you can kind of move into a place in your life where the, the Spirit working in your life becomes quenched. Not that we have any, I don't think, strength or power in, in of ourselves to quench him, because the idea of quench means, the word actually means to um, kind of put a fire out or to diminish the effects of a fire. But it's going to be by the way that we live our lives that the Holy Spirit doesn't have full access through us because of things going on. I think between Ephesians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, I think we're going to come to grips with how we can actually do that. And then what do we do if that's happening in our lives? So starting back in verse 11 of Ephesians 4, and these will be on the screen, this is what Paul says. We're going to work down to verse 30 where he says, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So it says, And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, or shepherds and teachers is the idea, for the equipping of the saints, uh, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. The idea is for the, for the training up or the guiding of the body of Christ till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow, grow in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. This I say, therefore, in testifying the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles, the idea is the unbelieving world, the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God, because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lewdness to work all uncleanness with greediness, but you have not learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, um, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. And right here's where Paul, flip, he turns a little bit. He says, therefore, because of all that what I've said, therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak with his neighbor, speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole, stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, uh, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, the idea is that building up word, that strengthening, that teaching, that guiding word, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And this is where he says it. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You know, by Paul saying that, that means that we actually can. He's warning us not to. And he's not even saying that the church in Ephesus is doing that. It's just a warning. Don't do this. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed. Now, you go back to Ephesians 1. He talks about the sealing of the Holy Spirit. It says, for the day of redemption. He says, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And, and here it is. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted. You can almost let, add love in there because back there in verse 16, he talks about loving one another, forgiving one another, 
just as God in Christ forgave you. And for me, as I used to kind of underline my notes up here, it's the just as statement. You know, forgiving one another, not just simply forgiving, you know, Jim does something and whatever, I forgive him, he's not done anything, I'm just, but if he does, you know, but I forgive him just as. It, that's how we're to operate as a body of believers, just as it says, you know, Christ, as we're forgiven in Christ by God. That's the just as, you know, it's unconditional forgiveness, it's, you know, not holding that person, you know, he, he asks for forgiveness, I forgive him, and I don't think about it anymore. He's, that's how the body is united together. But if we're not acting like that, if, we, if we're doing kind of the things there in verse 31, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, you know, those things begin to grieve the Holy Spirit of God because he has, like what Tozer said, such a great love and care for his church, for us. And so we can actually grieve the heart. So if you go back down through it, as I was thinking of, verse, of verses 11 um, down uh, through 24, just kind of picking apart things so you can kind of underline and, and make a list of different things that he's talking about in and around verse 30 of how we can actually grieve the Holy Spirit of God or hinder his work in our lives. I kind of went back through and picked through some things that kind of stood out to me of how, John, how can I grieve his spirit? What are some things in my, own, my life that could actually grieve his spirit, which ultimately could turn to 1 Thessalonians 5, that very well may quench that work of the spirit in our lives. Now, we're still children of God, we're still sealed, and we're moving towards that day of redemption, uh, but the work of God in our lives, when we compare to these great people we talk about, it's just not there, because he's wanting to deal with some things in our lives, and it's all because of love and grace that he has uh, towards us. So as I pick back down through those, back there in verse 12, you know, the responsibility specifically that I have as a pastor, teacher, or a shepherd, a teacher, is to equip you guys. The idea is mending to completion, mending so that you guys are equipped then to do ministry for the work of ministry, for the edifying or the building up, the training of the body of Christ. If I'm not doing that, I think I'm grieving the Holy Spirit of God. I think there's something there in my life. If I'm not being obedient to that, if I'm not training you guys up to do ministry, you know, to love one another, to be united, you know, and there's times, <clears throat> and to be honest, let's just be honest with you, who does church discipline? And no one's getting disciplined. There's no discipline coming. I don't know anything. But seriously, in churches, if you guys have experienced churches, who actually has ever experienced Matthew 18 kind of church discipline? It doesn't happen. I've never seen it. You know, how do you, I mean, obviously that's done in grace and that's done in love, but... That's what the body is supposed to be all about, building each other up. There, verse 13 talks about having the unity of the faith, that we're united together, that we're of one mind, one heart, one spirit in the faith. That it says there that we're also to grow into the knowledge. And you get that sense from 11 uh, down through 24, the sense of growing to know Christ, that he is the head, that we're to look like Christ. It's growing into the fullness, into being a mature Christian. You get that as you go down through that section. The one, too, the verse 14, where he is, is warning them to be on guard against people that uh, will come in and, says, and, and will toss you to and fro or carry you about by every wind of doctrine. I think sometimes if we begin to follow doctrine that's not of Christ, it's outside of God's Word, we can grieve the Holy Spirit of God. The warning's there, so that for me, as I look at that, that's going to happen. You know, Jude tells us that we're to contend earnestly for the faith that was delivered once and for all to the saints, for men will creep in and begin to bring different doctrines about Christ and begin to present a different Jesus. And if we begin to listen to that, that's why I always tell people to examine everything you listen to, especially in the, technology, the age that we live in. You get it on TV, on your phones, you get so many people. What, if what they say doesn't line up with God's Word, if they're not teaching God's Word, red flags need to come up. And I believe that if you begin to follow them, you can begin to grieve the Holy Spirit because you're, you, may, and you may end up following a different Jesus. You may, and that's just the truth. And we, we, we need to stay focused in God's Word, so I think that we can do that. I would grieve the Holy Spirit of God if I allowed or if I saw something or saw you got following something that, and, and Billy, I think it's something Stephen posted one time, I, I, I totally agreed with it. Sometimes I think as Christians, the article said, we have to be careful that we don't title everybody heretics out there. We're, we're the heretic hunters. You know, I, I wrestle through things. I listen to what people say. You know, I think if you spend some time, especially in First and Second John, uh, the side of the doctrines of Christ, what, what is a heretic, what's not, who, should, who you should kind of listen to, who you should follow, who you should, whatever. Spend some time. God's Spirit will teach you, because that's what he tells us here, that Christ is teaching us these things. Verse 15 tells us that we speak the truth in love. We can speak the truth in love. You know, I can speak the truth and not have love, and it becomes brutal. Or I can just simply love you, and this is kind of a Wearsby thing, but I can love you but never speak the truth, and I'm playing the hypocrite. 
It's a combination of I'm going to speak to you, but I'm going to speak to you in a heart of love, unconditional love, because I love you, and I'm concerned about your walk with Christ. I'm concerned about where the storehouse is going, uh, because, and I think if you study Ephesians specifically 1 down through 32, this is a great model for the church. Just take this and take the church in Philadelphia in Revelation 3 and just put them together and just study them. Look, look at what Jesus says is really not a perfect church, because no, there's no perfect churches, but it's a model church. It's what he wants us to do. But ultimately there in verse 21 it says that we have been taught by him and as the truth that is in Christ. See, we, we focus on Jesus. We're, we're pursuing him. We're growing in a deeper relationship with him. If we're doing all those things, then we're not going to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. But the truth is, if we find ourselves falling into some of that stuff, anger, bitterness, clamor, you know, evil speaking, not wanting to forgive, not acting tender-hearted towards the, uh, the, the brethren, we can then actually grieve the Holy Spirit. So let's flip over now to 1 Thessalonians 5. I would actually encourage you guys just to spend some time in Ephesians 4, just reading that whole chapter, 1 through 32. It's a great chapter where Paul just talks about what it looks like to be a growing, uh, you know, disciple of Jesus Christ. And things we, you should be on guard um, against, but also how you should be growing, how we should be growing. 1 Thessalonians 5. So Paul closes out this letter to the church of Thessalonica. He just kind of gives us real quick, they're real short verses, you know, it's like pray, do, do that, give, and... And so right there in the middle of verse 19, it says, do not quench the spirit. But I want to read this within context, so to speak, as he closes this letter out to the church and, and to us this morning for our exhortation. Back in verse 12, when we're work down through that to verse 24, Paul says this. He says, and we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you. Now, as we go down through this, we'll kind of pick out these action words, things that, that, that really we should be doing as disciples of Christ, as, as the church. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize, there's an action, we're to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love. Everything's done in love for their work's sake. There's another word, be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, and here's another action, we warn those who are unruly. Comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, and see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything, uh, give thanks. It kind of reminds me, Paul hits this verse, I'm mean, sorry, Clark Robinson hits this verse um, all the time, Romans 8, 28, you know, all things work together for the good of those that love God and are called according to his purposes. May I see that in that verse? In everything give thanks, even during the trials and the difficulties of life, the questions of life, we always give thanks, knowing that God is working something greater in our lives to make us look more like Christ. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And then verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold fast what is good. Abstain. That is just, don't even come close. Do away with. Don't abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. What an encouraging promise is that letter, and there's a couple more verses, but as that letter kind of closes, it says here, he who calls you is faithful, you know, he is faithful and he will do it. He is going to sanctify us to completion. He's going to preserve us to blamelessness when Christ comes back. What a great promise that is that we can hold on to, that he's the one that's doing the work, but at the same time, we have to understand what does it mean to grieve God's spirit, and then what does it mean if it moves towards that place where he says there in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Like I said, that word quench means to kind of just to put out the effects of a, a warm fire, to put out the effects of a fire. You know, you're, you know, if you've ever thrown water in a fire and it begins to come down and it cracks, that's what that means. It's, that's what's happening in a person's life. As you begin to quench the spirit, you're doing that. It's, you know, and like I said, I don't think that we have power in of ourselves to hold the Holy Spirit back because what he's looking for, and I brought him up as examples, obviously Christ, uh, Paul, Peter, Moody, all these guys, they were willing vessels. They were obedient. They were submitted to God. They were, they were kind of, you know, as Jesus was praying, not my will, but thine be done. You know, here I am, as Paul responded to Christ, he says, you know what, Lord, what would you have me to do now? 
No conditions attached. No strings. To, what would, he didn't say, what would you have me to do now except go back to the Pharisees because they're going to kill me. Well, he ran into those guys. He said, what would you have me to do, Lord? No condition. And that's when Jesus speaks and says, you know what? I'm going to show Paul what he's going to have to do for him. He's going to suffer greatly for my name. He's going to testify before kings and before people of authority and rulers. And as you follow the life of Paul, that's exactly what happened. No strings attached. And God used him in a powerful way. And I think sometimes when we say that, <clears throat> probably not all wholeheartedly, but like, Lord, what would you have me to do? I'm submitted to It's easy to, um, you know, if you, what's the old song? I surrender all, all to Jesus. I don't know how that song goes. I'm not, I don't want to sing, but that's why I'm not up here before. I surrender all. The song should really be, or should be, the lyric should be, help me to surrender all. Because the truth is, we're not really surrendering all. Let's just be honest. I don't surrender all. I'm sure you guys, at some level, as you kind of go through your life, you don't surrender everything to Christ. Help me to surrender all should be the song, should be the prayer of our lives. Because if we're not willing to surrender everything into his hand, hand to count the cost of what it means to be a disciple of Christ, I think the grieving begins to happen, especially if how we act. And, and I think within you read this within context of Ephesians 4, what he's talking about here is how we act with one another. I see the church in Ephesians 4. I don't see any instructions to the world. Yes, we're to do the work of ministry out into the world. We're to love people. You know, but we're to hold one another accountable. We're to love one another. We're to treat each other tenderheartedly. We're to treat each other as a united family. You know, I, was, uh, I, was, I think I was sharing with Jim or Stephen, I was watching a Francis Chan video, so two weeks ago we actually showed a real short one, just what Francis, uh, if you guys are familiar with Francis Chan, you know, he pastored like a 5,000 member megachurch out in California and began to see some things that just, you know, he just felt like the Lord was moving him away from. And I ran across this other video, uh, about a nine minute video, uh, where he was being interviewed uh, by, uh, and it looked like he was in front of a bunch of college kids, and he was kind of retelling the story, some of the things I've already heard, but the one thing that he said in there, which really stuck out, matter of fact, I just kind of wrote it down, paraphrased it, and uh, he said that when he was pastoring that big church, he ran into this young man who used to be involved with something like the Latin Kings or, or the, some kind of like a violent gang out in California. He gets saved. He comes to know Christ in that church in Simi Valley. And he comes into the church and he's baptized. And he's excited. You know, there's this new thing. You know, if you understand gangs, um, many times young men and women as well come into gangs because they have no family. They're looking for family. They're looking for community. They're looking for somebody to care about them and love them. And so this young man gets saved. The Lord does a work in his life. He gets baptized, and he's like, you know, what's next? And he's so excited to be a part of this family. And as Francis was talking to him, and this kid, this kid was very honest with Francis, and he said, you know, he said, I thought, it was, I thought joining the church was going to be like getting jumped into a gang. Does anybody know what that means, to get jumped into a gang? If you, ever, if you know, to become a gang member, especially in those violent gangs, it means you, got, you get beat into the gang. You have to go through a beating to get into the gang. That's how you get into the gang. And so the kid, because that's what he went through, he's like, you know, I thought jo joining the church was like that you get kind of beat in and then they accept you. You come in according to the rules and they accept you. He says, but when I came into the church, he says, I, I didn't experience family. I didn't experience community. And that was the, that was the thing that it was just more confirmation for Francis for when, where Francis went in his own life. And he eventually resigned from the church and went to, back to China for a while and, and did some things. And just, and he's doing th some things differently now. See, it's important how we, as a church, get along, uh, because I, I think I wrote something on Facebook here recently about this. If you read John 17, uh, Jesus says in that prayer that the unity and really the love we have for one another is going to be the greatest apologetic for Christ. I think it's by around about verse 23 of, of, 17, of John 17. He says, your unity, the way that you guys get along, you know, if, you're do, if we're doing what, we, what you're supposed to be doing here in Ephesians 4, 1 Thessalonians, we're praying, we're lifting each other up, we're, you know, yes, at times we are you know, holding each other accountable, but we're also comforting each other. We're always together. We're being patient with one another, tenderhearted, loving one another. When the world sees that, it testifies of who Christ is, because he's the only one that could do that. It's this able to do thing we talked about, this power, having the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our midst, the ability to do, and for here specifically, the ability to care for one another, to love one another, to be that family that that young man didn't experience. And when that is being seen, you, you can't argue against that. We, we can debate and argue and get involved in all the apologetics and doing all that stuff. You can't argue against love. You can't do it. When someone sees unconditional love, they see that you care about them and you're going to be consistent in their lives and you're going to be part of a family. Jesus says that's going to be the greatest testimony that God sent me for the redemption of mankind. 
And that's why it's so important for us. And so to answer the question, you know, what can hinder the Holy Spirit? There's things in our lives. And so I would just encourage you to read through Ephesians 4, 1 Thessalonians. Maybe you just take that before the Lord. I'm going to close with John chapter 7, 37 through 39. John chapter 7. So we've kind of been talking about the church, this side of Christ's resurrection, this side of Christ going back to heaven. Now we're going to listen to something Jesus says about this able to do, this power to do, having the Spirit living in our lives. John 7 says this, On the last day, the climax, or the great day of the feast, or the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and he shouted to the crowds, Anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare, uh, rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And then John says about that, he says, when he said living water, he was speaking of the Spirit, who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the Spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. You know, what a great promise that is. That if we trust and we believe in Jesus Christ, as the Savior of our lives, as the Lord of our lives, and we tell Him, Lord, I'm going to follow You, You're worthy to be followed. You're worthy to be followed. You indeed are the forgiveness of my sins. You're the one that makes me right before God. When you confess those things to Him, and when you begin to follow Him, the promise that Jesus says here is, I am going to give you the Holy Spirit. And we see that in Acts 2, where the church was born, and lives were radically changed, and people were united, and you, you get that sense. Throughout, you just do a study of the word in one accord. Just see how many times it says that in one accord they were together. They were always together, rejoicing, praying, giving thanks, speaking the word in boldness, and lives are being changed. And through that, Matthew 28, 19 and, 19 and 20 come about. When Jesus promised, I will be with you to the very end of the age. He's doing the work in and through these disciples' lives because they were submitted to his work. They were submitted to this able to do, this power to do. There's going to be a, this last word. I was just kind of, as I was thinking about what Jesus says there in John 7, also the end of Revelation, where Jesus says the Spirit and the Bride say come. That the Holy Spirit's job, if you actually read uh, there in John's Gospel, his job is to draw people to Christ. That's what he does. He shows them their need for a Savior. He shows them that they are sinful. It's okay just to say that they're sinful. We're all sinful. That they need a Savior. He, and, and he's always saying, come. But see, he also says it's the job of the bride as well. The, the, the spirit and the bride say, come. Come to Jesus. That is the testimony, this ability to do, or this power we see there in Acts 1.8. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. <clears throat> what we're telling people is, come. Come. Come meet this Jesus that I met. I met him 19 years ago, but you might have met him, you know. Come and meet this man that I met. As a matter of fact, he's more than a man. This is who I am. This is what he's done in my life. Come. That's what Jesus is telling all people to do, is to come. And so this morning, we're going to end kind of in a time of prayer as we normally do. <clears throat> as you think about through Ephesians 4 and 1 Thessalonians 5, you think of the words there of Christ in John 7. <clears throat> Paul exhorts us to examine ourselves, to examine our hearts. You know, is there something in your life that you, you can honestly say, and maybe God's speaking to you right now, and you know it. Like, you, you just got that, you know, you just you're, you feel a, something in you. It's like, is there something in my life right now that might be actually grieving his spirit? Not that I've lost his spirit and all, you know, we're not going anywhere like that. But that I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm a child of God, I'm walking with him. But I'm just, I'm in a, in a place of maybe I've grieved him. And I'm grieving him because he has such great love for me. Remember, you can't grieve someone where there's not love. He loves us that much. Is there something, as you go through the kind of, you know, am I, am I, do I find myself in verse 31 there of Ephesians 4? You know, is there a bitterness in me towards somebody? Am I angry towards somebody else? Is there, you know, and it's really amongst the brethren, amongst the church, here in the church. Is there, or maybe it's just simply I've quenched the spirit because there's something, maybe I'm back in those other verses where I'm walking now according to the Gentiles. That I'm, just not, I'm not walking the walk. You know, I leave out of here on Sunday morning, and really my Monday through Saturday is, is not much, is, you know, I kind of look like everybody else. And you recognize that. And what God is saying is, is, I love you, that's not what I have for you. I don't have that for you. I want my spirit to operate through you. I want my spirit to be able to give you the ability to do with power. 
to live that life. But many times what, it, what, it, what it happens, I think, or what has to happen in our lives is we have to come to a place where we confess it. Say, I'm in that place right now, constantly almost. Lord, I don't have the ability to do. I struggle with things. There's things that, you know, it's like, I'm going to be very honest with you. Sometimes I, I, I look where I'm at and I'm like, Lord, I don't even have a clue what I'm doing here. But I'm honest and I tell him that. Because I know he knows what he's doing. And I said, Lord, just use me however. Speak to me. You know, when I don't listen, you know, sh- you know you've got to kind of shake me a little bit. You know, sometimes we have to do, just be that desperate. Lord, I want the ability to do, and not that I want to be like these famous people of old, but Lord, I, I want to have an impact around in people in my lives, in my family, my friends, my, the workplace, maybe it's students, whatever. I want to be able to know what your, vo- what your voice is saying to me. So that's you this morning if you want to come up for prayer. Maybe you just simply call, say, Lord, I want the ability to do. I don't see it right now in my life. And you come with desperation. Are you thirsty, as Jesus says? Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. Are you thirsty for something greater? I am. I am. I want the ability to affect Greencastle and Mercersburg and Hagerstown and Chambersburg or wherever the Lord might send me. How I live my life. How I live my life. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word. Lord, it brings great comfort to our to our lives, Lord, to our souls, to know that, that you love us. That, Father, your grace, Lord, has been poured out on us because of Christ. That we don't have to do anything, Lord, to merit our salvation. That it's free. But, Lord, at the same time, you, you, because of the Spirit living in us, Lord, you ask us that there's things that we do put on the new man, put off the old man. Walk in unity, walk in love. Be imitators of God, your word says. Be holy for, Lord, you're holy. Go into all the world and to make disciples. Lord, we can't do any of that. But Lord, we know that you have promised the gift of the Holy Spirit, the power, the ability to do those things in our lives. Lord, to to first change us to Give us strength and and eyes to see, ears to hear, hearts to obey. Lord, help us to just step out into the unknown. Knowing, Lord, that promise that you're with us to the very end of the age. Lord, we thank you for your word, the challenge of it. We thank you for the comfort of it. Lord, give us the boldness to act on it. In Jesus' name. Amen.